oil demand is peaking soon, so what does that mean for the Houston economy? Plus, a new law is placing greater accountability on drunk drivers, and how a trip to Wyoming could have been the reason a politician dropped out of a race. It's time to recap some of the biggest stories of the week with Pulitzer Prize finalist Evan Mintz and dynamic media personality Andrew Shell Nova. It's Friday, June 23rd. I'm Raheel Ramsnali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Aunt Rochelle, Evan, good morning. Welcome in. How's everybody doing? It's good. It's good over here. I am doing great. It rained this week. It rained. We needed it. I know. It's such a nice break from all that heat. All right, before we get started with the news, we had an episode earlier this week about the best burgers in the city. So I need to get your picks, okay? Aunt Rochelle, give me your best burger in the city. Listen, the best burgers in Third Ward at Cream Burger, right across from U of H, adjacent to Texas Southern, cash only, little bitty spot, amazing burger. Do you hear me? The name says it all, Cream Burger, that meat and that bun and bread just melts right on in your mouth, baby. I've never had that. I'm adding that to my list when I go to U of H games. That's my pregame spot. Okay. You need to go and get a milkshake. Oh, of course. They make it there. It's all original. And the fries? <laughs> yeah, you're going to love it. Okay, that's a good recommendation. How about you, Evan? Oh, my go-to for the best burger is Bex Prime. Uh, I think they've got excellent, super thick shakes. They've got really good hickory cheeseburger, which is my favorite. They've got root beer in the bottles. Now, it is pretty expensive there, but I feel like you're getting what you pay for. Yeah, absolutely. So do you do your loan application before you get there or do you do it on site? Because, man, Bex Prime is expensive. Baby. Uh, my my go to for Bex Prime is whenever my parents are like, oh, let's all go out for burgers somewhere. Let's take the grandkids. I'm like, oh, yeah, when we go to a Bex Prime or something. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Make the grandparents pay. I love it. I love it. Right. All right. Let's jump into the news. It was a busy week. As always, Aunt Rochelle, ladies first. Tell me, what was your biggest story of the week? Listen, the biggest story of the week for me was Bentley's law has passed in Texas. And that's a law where drunk drivers involved in a deadly crash must pay restitution to orphan children. This is extremely important because it's about prevention and accountability. It makes requires the convicted drunk drivers involved in a deadly collision to pay monthly restitution to the kids that are orphaned in the accident and if the DWI offender receives prison time. The new law requires support payments begin one year after release and continue until the surviving children reach the age of 18. You cannot run. You cannot hide from this law. You have hurt these children. You have taken their parents. And now you must Absolutely. Now, this is, it sounds like this is a very personal story for you. Why is this? This is personal to me because this past August, the week after my son's fourth birthday, a drunk driver came out of nowhere and hit my husband and my four year old baby and um, almost killed them. I, I mean, in an instant. And I thank God for that. I mean, it was that was a long road to recovery um, because of someone's carelessness. And this was in the middle of the day. And this was a young person, a, a drunk person. Um, and my son uh, had to get stitches in his eye. Um, he had to be, you know, almost life lighted, you know, and, and my husband was banged up real bad. He was passed out. It was, it was bad. Had my child went through that windshield. I don't think we would probably know each other, you guys, because I wouldn't even know who I am. And although I am not the child in this law protects children, this drunk drivers ruin families, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. family. So this is why I am rooting for this because had it went a different way, you know, I would have lost my entire family, just like these children who these drunk drivers have now made orphans. Absolutely. Accountability and prevention so big with Bentley's law. And, you know, you just hope that whenever somebody's thinking about drinking and driving, they think about this, that they will be on the hook for this. Right. And you also have the burden of ruining an entire family. So maybe this prevents that person from getting into that car. Evan, any thoughts? You know, I think it's always really important to help set people right after they've been hurt. But the idea of extracting that wealth from the person who perpetrated the crime you know, you might end up finding you're trying to squeeze water out of a rock. 
And also what we know is that if you want to prevent crimes, you have to focus on the prevention and the certainty of being caught rather than the severity of the punishment. I would really like to see a lot more effort put into, say, automated cameras to catch people who are speeding. I like to see a lot more focus on providing free alternative transportation for people who are at bars or just basically say that bars don't have to provide parking spaces. If you build a bar in Houston, you're required to build many, many parking spots. Why? We don't want people driving to bars. Like, let's mm. at least give here bars the option to say we're a car free zone. Like, take a cab here, take an Uber, take Metro. Wow, that's a good idea. I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. I never thought of that. I love the way Evan you you gave it a whole new light. Let's 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 stop it before mm -hmm. it gets there. I love it. All right, Evan. How about you? What was your biggest story of the week? The big story of the week was the announcement by Michael Kubosh, city council member, that he is dropping out of the race for city controller. Now, Michael Kubosh was running for this position of the budget watchdog in city hall. And he was basically, in my mind, one of the key front runners. But on Monday, he said he was having health issues and he decided to drop out. But then right after that, Channel 11 drops a story that they had dug into his campaign dollars and found that he'd likely misspent up to seven thousand dollars over six years on just family trips and restaurants and all sorts of things. For example, he reported about $600 spent for, quote, travel and district that really was apparently spent by him and his family on a vacation in Wyoming. Now, if you are running <laughs> for the city's budget watchdog, the last thing you want is to be caught misusing your own budget. Like these are campaign dollars. They can't be spent on personal stuff like this. Now, blood is in the water. And I can expect more scrutiny of candidate campaign finances as we run up to November. I can't wait to see what else is out there. So do you think Channel 11 asked for a comment and kind of gave the word to them that this story is about to hit and that's why he dropped out? Is that what's happening? Correlation is not causation. So I don't have <laughs> any like proof of causal relationships here. But what I do have is a timeline. And it just all seems pretty interesting to me. Mm, mm, mm. Y'all, but real talk, y'all don't think Channel 11 is being petty? Like, and hear me out. You always hear about politicians misusing a lot of money. Y'all, it's $7,000. Hear me out. That ain't that much. I was expecting 17, 17. Seven thousand. Come on, y'all. Like, come on. You know, when you're in when you're doing city elections, they're not as big as those federal elections. But yeah. I think it's more about, you know, the the ideal of what you're looking for. You want someone who's going to treat this budget uh, with seriousness, who's going to look at it through an ethical lens. And if you can't practice what you preach in the campaign, you can't expect it when you're elected to office. Now, I remember not too long ago, Rodney Ellis, the count, uh, county commissioner, Rodney Ellis was hit with similar look at how he's spending his campaign dollars. And it was kind of striking to see how much money he was spending at a Smoothie King near his house. And they asked him, what are you doing <laughs> spending like campaign dollars at a Smoothie King near your house? And he says, well, this is where I go to meet with constituents. They say they want to meet with me. So I go to Smoothie King, I get us the smoothies and we talk about issues. I'm like, well, I, I mean, I guess that's okay. I don't know. It's just really weird. What a spin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's, it could be $7, Andrew Shell. It's all about the ethics okay. of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. It's the point. I get yeah. it. But I was like, y'all, it's 7000 <laughs> That's petty. But why throw away your campaign over 7000 Because it's the other way, too. He didn't have to spend that $7,000 $7, over six years. You think Michael Kubash couldn't have gotten that out of pocket? He couldn't have done that himself? True. Yeah. But y'all, he went to Wyoming. I mean, he didn't even go nowhere fun. So anyway, but I get it. I I'm with it. <laughs> My biggest story of the week, we've got some updates from the Harris County Jail. Two more inmates have died. Now, this time the jail is saying that it's because of pre-existing conditions, but Eight people have died so far. That number could be 12, uh, according to ABC 13. So it depends on where you're getting the story. 
but more inmates are dying inside Harris County Jail. And this is coming off last year where 27 inmates died. There's currently over 9,500 inmates at the county jail. And that is a low number as of right now. We've seen it hit 10,000. We've seen inmates being shipped to other jails as well. And there is a total disaster right now within Harris County Jail. Oh, mm -hmm. gosh. That's heavy. You know, just thinking about it from the political lens, Sheriff Ed Gonzalez is up for re-election. And you've got to wonder, is this something that's going to weigh over him as he tries to get re-elected? Now, from a policy perspective, I've seen him really try to do everything right on a lot of this stuff, but his hands are tied by state law. It's up to the judges to really move these cases along. It's up to the DA to decide to drop charges in cases that aren't going anywhere. But he's the guy who's in charge of the facility. You know, the buck stops there. Absolutely. And if you want to learn more about what's happening inside Harris County jails, I've linked our episode on that with Pooja Lodia from Channel 13 in our show notes. You got to listen to it because not much is changing as of right now. All right, Aunt Shell, let's talk about your most overlooked story of the week. What do you got? So listen, I don't really think the story is overlooked. It's a piece of the story that is overlooked and it's bothering me. A 13-year-old Houston girl uh, came up missing. Her last known whereabouts was in Galveston. Um, they said the 13-year-old was located uh, with the assistance of the FBI Houston, FBI Kansas, and the Kansas City Police Department. She was said to be found with a nun family member, adult male, in the apartment complex. And according to investigators, officials revealed the 13-year-old girl was possibly in the Kansas City, uh, Missouri area and coordinated effort uh, began to locate her. Now, here's the part that has been overlooked and it is bothering me. No information about the adult male will be released at this time. Why not? Mm. What's going on? Right. There was a big deal when this young lady was missing. This Houston little girl was missing. I know because it came all across my timeline. It was on my cell phone and it erupted a lot of things. And I was like, where is this baby? Right. There was suspicion that she met someone online. But please, guys, if we found this young lady, why are we not talking about the person who took her? Yeah, maybe the the investigation's ongoing right now. We'll learn more about it. And, you know, that's something that hopefully prevents future abductions or we learn more about what happened. And, you know, we can teach our children about, hey, don't talk to strangers online. Right. We, we don't know. So as we wait and learn that that's a good point. Like, what do we know about this guy? Right. And the reason why I'm concerned is because. As much dramatics as we went through to find her, we found her, right? That wasn't a huge to-do. It wasn't a breaking news, right? Because everybody was looking for her. We found her. But what the heck is going on and why are we not up in arms or uh, uh, rejoicing that this young lady was found? I'm very concerned about this and I will be keeping my eye on this story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Evan, how about you? What was your most overlooked story of the week? My most overlooked story of the week was an announcement from the International Energy Agency forecasting that they think we are about to hit peak oil consumption in the transportation sector. Basically, that the world is on the verge of buying the most gasoline, most diesel than we ever have. And after that, it's a downward trend. Now, if you are in the business of selling and making gasoline and diesel, and suddenly you hear, well, we're probably not going to buy as much as we used to. That's some bad news. That is bad news for Houston. And I think this uh, announcement really should have us thinking about what it is our city is proactively doing and what the state is proactively doing to make sure that we remain economically successful throughout the next century. You know, even the Shell CEO is saying like, yeah, we're pretty sure that we're about to hit uh, peak oil consumption and transportation. Now, there is some hope that the chemical sector is growing. We're still going to be consuming a whole lot more petrochemicals because of that. But I want to make sure that Houston doesn't go the way of like West Virginia or whale oil towns in Connecticut or all those Rust Belt cities that hit their peak and didn't do anything to make sure they stay on top. So we will hit peak consumption. And then is it going to be just a downward trend or are we going to plateau out? Probably about a plateau. You know, they call it lower for longer is what it's thinking rather mm -hmm. than continuous growth. And you can still have a pretty successful industry as long as people are buying it and you have certain expectations and you consolidate and you cut costs. 
But then you see this whole sort of hot energetic energy industry that relies on you know outside investors and really exciting innovation becomes something that's a little bit more staid and boring and routine. And you don't get that kind of uh, economic energy that really makes a city thrive and grow. So why is it going to drop, right? Like I'm just thinking from the outside perspective, there's already tons of cars on the road, Mm -hmm. right? There's going to be more cars hitting, right? As more drivers are getting to the legal age, there's going to be more cars. Why is it going to drop? Any idea? Two big things are happening. One is the shift to electric vehicles. And the other is that because of the rise of Zoom, that people are able to communicate over the internet much more than they used to. People are working from home. They're not traveling as much for work. So it just becomes less necessary to drive. Or could it be that this is the beginning of the zombie apocalypse? (laughs) (laughs) Listen, if those zombies drive cars, I'm okay. (laughs) Yeah, Evan, you mentioned that there are just more electric vehicles on the road. Well, guess what? 200,000 are now registered in Texas. So... Hey, that is a factor here in the state and just around the Houston area, just unofficially, you just see more electric vehicles on the road. So all of that, a big factor in the decline in gasoline. No, it's really cool stuff. And it has uh, ramifications for the Texas grid and energy production. And we just want to be ahead of the curve on all of this stuff. All right. My most overlooked story of the week. Guys, the roads are literally buckling because it is so hot outside. I don't know if y'all saw Mm -hmm. this earlier in the week, but from Beltway 8 to Highway 6 and so many other roads, the roads are literally buckling because of this oppressive heat. And I always used to laugh at weathermen when they would say oppressive heat. But being outside (laughs) yesterday during that heat and over the weekend... It is absolutely oppressive, and it is so crazy how hot it is outside. A road that I use, the feeder for 99 Grand Parkway, the roads buckle there. There's a huge pothole now, and it is nuts just how hot it is outside. You know, somebody asked me, should I even bring clothes when I come to Houston? Because y'all should be naked right now. And I said, girl... (laughs) You right. Just bring the bare minimum. Mm-hmm. Just cover the vitals because it's hot, y'all. It's bad. It's bad out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody said, um, I haven't seen the kids outside playing. I said, Child, it's hot. Yeah. yeah. It's hot. We don't go outside until seven o'clock. There's oh, no yeah. you, right. you don't want to you don't want the kids to get a heat stroke. It is too hot. No. Oh yeah. Not taking them outside during midday heat because that is just a dumb move. All right, let's get to our moment of joy. What sparks some joy in you, Aunt Rochelle? I am so excited to announce the inaugural Higher Education Social Media Summit put on by the University of Houston downtown with your keynote speaker, Dr. Daniel Villanueva Jr. and your girl, Antrochel Nova. Nice. I'm excited about this because if you guys don't know, social media is not going anywhere. It's not. And if you are in higher education or if you know someone who does, you know higher education is very traditional and they're losing their students because they're not getting active on social media. So the University of Houston downtown enrollment management team has come together and we are going to put on a higher education social media summit on July 20th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And it is free 99, baby. Come one day, learn some tips and tricks about social media. If you are a business owner, if you are just somebody who wants to learn how to get into it, come on over to the university, baby. And we can teach you a couple of things. Nice. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. I love it. I love it. Hey, embracing social media in higher education is really important and better connects the students and faculty and creates your school spirit overall. So I like that. I like that. All right, Evan, how about you? What was your moment of joy? So my moment of joy was seeing that the Greater Houston Partnership has picked their new CEO, Steve Kane of Kinder Morgan. Now, for those who don't know, the Greater Houston Partnership is the mega chamber of commerce that represents all of the business interests of Houston, but they take a holistic view on it too. 
good business means happy workers. It means a healthy environment. It means infrastructure that works. And so they're always trying to be on the leading edge of making sure that Houston has what we need to be a successful city. Now, for the past decade plus, it has been led by Bob Harvey. He's a great guy who came out of McKinsey and Reliant Energy. But Steve Kane, the new CEO, comes out of Kinder Morgan, a pipeline company, real company man. And I'm hoping to see that a guy with this real oil and gas background can do a bit of Nixon to China stuff on making sure that we are going where we need to go on hydrogen, on geothermal, on carbon capture, on renewables, on grid work, on all of that stuff that really shows where the energy industry is going. And Houston is a city for business. Nice, nice. Congratulations to him. That's a good thing. And hopefully it means more business here in the city of Houston. All right. My moment of joy. It was a rough start because we thought the Pride Festival would mean that there's no Pride Parade in downtown Houston. But the 45th Pride Houston Parade is this Saturday and Pride Houston 365 is teaming up with ABC 13. You can watch a live stream of the parade starting at 7.30 p.m. Uh, on ABC 13 and you can just check it out online as well. But you can go to the parade as well. And look, it's been a crazy year with so many different stories impacting the LGBTQ plus community. So for Saturday night to celebrate them and have some fun, that's good to see that the parade is on. The festival is off, but the parade is on. So go out there and celebrate and support the community. That's going to be fun. Oh, yeah. I always find it be really exciting. I've got, you know, little kids. So we don't exactly go to the parade, but there's an event Saturday at Levy Park for Pride. And I'm planning on taking the kids, going out, showing solidarity with my friends. Agreed. I was just thinking to myself, I think I'm going to take my baby out just so we can see like we support everyone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, love is love. You know, we support you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's more information in our show notes for all the stories we talked about. And Shell, Evan, thank you so much. Have a good weekend. All right. Be easy. Stay cool out there. That was Evan Mintz and Antra Shell Nova. Want more Houston news and things to do? Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter, Hey Houston, at houston.citycast.fm. That's all for this week here on CityCast Houston. Our lead producer is Dina Kespa. Our producer is Carleon Jones and AK Al Moment. Our newsletter editor is Brooke Lewis, and the host is me, Raheel Ramzanali. Our music is by the band All The Kimonos. We'll be back on Monday with a look at how the first step of the journey to Mars starts right here in Space City. Thank you for listening and I hope you learned something new. Now my, my son is up at like seven in the morning on weekends and I take him to the park and it's hot then. It is hot early morning. I'm out there with like a fan and shorts on. Like yes. I never wear shorts. I hate shorts. This is the first summer I have started wearing shorts. <laughs>